Good morning. Wow, man. Sounds like you all had coffee this morning, eh? That's excellent. Well, welcome. My name is Imran, one of the pastors here. Delighted that you are with us. If this is your first time, we're excited that you chose to worship with us this morning. After the service, if you have a question, talk to me or one of the other pastors. We'd love to chat with you. This morning, we have with us someone very special, John Rhodes, with his wife, Sana, over here. John is candidating for, the, for our worship um, uh, director, so would you please welcome John? Would you stand with me? Uh, I will quickly pray, and then John's going to lead us in our call to worship and lead us uh, as we worship. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you're with us. And we thank you that we're here this morning. We can sing and worship you. We ask that as we sing, would you find us faithful? We thank you for John and Sana. We ask that would you remind them that you're with them and for them. So encourage them this morning. And we do ask that through our worship and preaching of your word, that you encourage us, strengthen us, convict us and challenge us. Would you do your work in us and through us? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to be in the house of God this morning. Amen? Psalm 96 says, sing to the Lord a new song. So that's what we're going to do this morning. From the start, we're going to sing a new song for you this morning, and we want you to sing it with us, remembering what God has done in us and through us. Amen? Let's do that this morning. God has done. Look what God has done. He redeemed us with His blood. We were lost and dead in sin. He came for us. Look what God has done. He adopted us in love. We were orphans without hope. But now His children sing, Who are we? God has done through his sacrifice. Look what God has done through his sacrifice. We're one. Sinners unified by grace and bound together. Oh, look what God has done by his spirit through his son and by the power of his hand. He is sending us out. be glory through Christ our Savior's church forever through all generations to God be glory through Christ our Savior's work forever forever lift your hands lift your hands and Christ. He redeems his precious bride by his costly sacrifice. 
we're invited to see the wisdom, see the wisdom of his ways in the mystery of grace. Every age and every race, we're united. Who are we, church? Sing it out. Who are we that? Who are we that he would send us to God be glory? Christ our Savior's church through all generations. Be glory through Christ our Savior's work. We are forever and ever lift your hands and praise Him. See His great compassion, see His mercy for us. Raise your voice and thank Him. See the church He's Come on, church, let's welcome the Lord in this place. Let's lift up a clap offering of praise to Him this morning. Seeing how deep the Father is. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. turns his face away as wounds as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold behold Man upon the cross, my sin, my sin upon his shoulder. Shame, ashamed, I hear my mocking voice. Calls out, calls out among the scoffers. It was my sin, it was my sin that held him there. Until it was accomplished, oh, his dying breath, his dying breath has brought me life. Oh, I know, I know that it is finished. Yes, see. power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, only Him, His death and resurrection, only Him, why should I gain from His reward, I cannot give Have paid my rent. 
But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my rent Prophet Isaiah says this Seek the Lord while he may be found Call upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God. And here's the promise, for he will, will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. This is God speaking to us. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is a faithful God and he does not think in the same ways we think. He does not plan the same ways we plan. He does things differently and things much more beautifully than we do, amen? In fact, what we would have said is a tragedy. What we celebrated a few weeks ago is the death of Jesus was the most beautiful act of sacrifice and love that we could possibly imagine. Amen? So we're going to sing of Jesus now. We're going to sing of who Jesus is. We're going to celebrate the fact that he and his ways are better and higher than ours. Let's sing. Sing, you are. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. And our hope is in you alone. Our strength, our strength in your mighty name. Our peace in the dark day remains. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Come on, sing this to the Lord this morning. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see the victory come. We hold on. To every promise you ever made, Jesus, you are unfailing. Yes, you are. You never fail. It's our guide through the wilderness. Our joy in the heaviness. Our way. When it seems there is no way, it's Jesus. This we know, we will see the enemy run. This we know, we will see a victory come. We hold on to every promise you have. to him this morning. We trust you say higher than our own. We trust Lord, we trust you for your way. Forever we trust you. Oh God, we trust you, Lord.
this to the Lord as a promise. Declare this to our hearts saying we trust you. So we trust you. We trust you. You sing, church. Thank you, worship team. All right, all the children and the ushers, if you could make your way forward, and the leaders. And if this is your first time, uh, we as a church are learning a memory verse. So they have memorized the verse of them last week, which they will say, and then together we will read aloud our verse for the uh, coming week. Okay, Miss Alfreda. Um, do we have, yeah, so we have the verse up on the screen, Genesis 25, verse 23. Okay, are we ready to start? Okay. done all right okay how about we say the next one together now that you're here okay can we <laughs> all right genesis 28 verse 15 okay behold Amen. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and we'll pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, these little ones. We, we praise you uh, for your word that they have the opportunity to learn and memorize. We do ask that would you use this word to draw them to you, that through this they will grow in their faith in you. We also pray for the leaders that as they teach, that would you be gracious to them, give them wisdom. And we thank you for the offerings we're about to take. We thank you for what you've given to us. We ask that as we give back to you, would you find it faithful? So we pray that as they head to the classes, that you do your work in them and through them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can head to your classes now. All right, while these guys are heading to their classes, I have a couple of announcements. The first one is men's barbecue is happening on Friday, May 17th. Um, suggested cost per plate is $25, and registration is now open. If you have been there, you know what to expect from the barbecue. Plenty of meat and bacon for those of you who love bacon. I, no, there's no bacon, I guess. Maybe. Anyway. Uh, also, our April is the financial year end uh, for our church, so we encourage you to prayerfully consider 
to give so that way we can finish strong at the end of this year. Um, single moms registration is now open, so if you want to pass along, um, you can go to our website and you can sign up. Um, same thing what we did last year, so that registration is now open or you can pass the word uh, around. Also, this morning I was told uh, that Woman of Hope is next Friday, not in May. And where's Heinz? Heinz is hiding somewhere. Heinz, it's now 1 o'clock. Your wife told me it's 12 o'clock. Yes, you're up there. Okay? So next Friday is 12 p.m. lunch. If you have any question, talk to Rosie. Uh, you can register for that lunch and come next Friday at 12 o'clock. All right. Um, th at this point, I want to call J uh, John and Sana to come forward, come up. Um, John... Uh, is going to, they're both uh, going to share the testimony, or at least John will do the talking, I was told. And uh, John, welcome. Uh, you can use this mic, I'll step aside, tell us yeah. what brought you to the promised land <laughs> from Texas. <laughs> Texas. Okay, and um, your testimony. Yeah, yeah. Okay, over to you guys. Good morning. Good morning. We are so excited to be here. I'm John. This is my wife of seven days, Sana. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Um, we are incredibly excited to be here. A little about a little about me and uh, my my journey to where I'm standing right now. Um, uh, when I was five, I I I feel like I need to share this part as as y'all have seen me walking around uh, the church already. Um, I had an accident when I was when I was real young and broke my left leg, and in the process was told that there is a condition that makes my bones brittle and easy to break. And so from the age of five to the age of 18, I broke my left femur 14 times in all manner of different accidents, being a little boy and being a, a dumb teenager. Um, and so that was, that was my life growing up. I had, I had great aspirations to be uh, an MLB pitcher, but God saw fit to remove that and give me uh, a gift of music and I started singing at a very young age and also uh, at a very young age at a conference or a, a revival uh, meeting at my at our church my family's church uh, gave my life to the Lord and followed Christ as much as a five-year-old could um, as much as a five-year-old can understand salvation and sanctification I, I believe I knew who Jesus was and trusted him uh, for my salvation uh, but as many stories go, I did not always stay um, in line and, uh, and attached to the word and to the vine and uh, ended up uh, rededicating my life through a series of accidents and um, just revelation about uh, where the Lord had me. Uh, when I was about 18 years old, uh, I believe it was at that time uh, God allowed me to make my faith my own and uh, not my parents' faith. Uh, I heard it said one time that uh, God does not have grandchildren. He has children. And so you can't ride your parents or your grandparents' coattails into heaven. It has to be your own. And so uh, I did that, became uh, a, a full follower of Christ and uh, it was around that time where I started leading worship in earnest as as a student, uh, as a student or youth leader, as well as a college student. Um, and during that time, I was given the opportunity to, uh, during those next several years, given the opportunity to uh, do full-time vocational ministry um, as uh, in a parent uh, a parachurch organization based out of Michigan. Um, and through that, was given the opportunity to learn about local church ministry, being on staff in a local church. And in 2017, uh, after going through a, uh, uh, an internship in Chicago, I moved uh, to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and was there for three years. And it was during that time I met um, this young woman's uh, brother, uh, Chand, and his family, uh, her included, and became really close with them. And uh, God used those years to uh, 
to grow me in my love for the Lord as well as uh, just personally as, a, as an individual. And um, during COVID, they were, they were relocated from, from K, uh, KL to Canada in December of 2019. And I moved back in December of 2020 after COVID and all of the complications surrounding that. Uh, was given the opportunity to uh, join the staff of a church in New Braunfels, Texas. I was telling the, the, the German, uh, the German uh, congregation this morning that uh, New Braunfels is a former uh, German settlement. And so there was a little bit of similarities in, in, in that this morning. So it was really cool to see multiple generations and multiple, uh, multiple ethnicities and uh, races singing and worshiping the Lord in different languages because God can understand them all. Amen. Uh, and so have been at uh, the church in New Braunfels now for three years and uh, both Sana and myself are trusting that the Lord is directing and guiding our next steps as uh, a newlywed couple as well as individuals as we grow closer to the Lord. So thank you all for having us. It's been a pleasure. Sana, do you want to say anything? Okay, that's all right. Yeah. I won't do anything. I won't ask you. Uh, let, let's pray uh, uh, for them and for us. But also after the service, we will have Q&A uh, time after the service. So stick around after the service. It's right in this room. Um, so yeah, that's where we can ask uh, John more questions uh, about his, maybe see if he speaks German as well or not. Right? So. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's pray. Much. Uh, Father, we're grateful uh, for your grace. We thank you that we can come together and sing that you saved us through Jesus who died on the cross for us. So we thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for what you've done for John and Sana. We pray that your will be done in their lives and your will be done for us as a church as well. That would you by your spirit direct us and them. We thank you for the testimony that we just heard and how you've been faithful to John and Sana. We pray that as they look back, they be encouraged that you're the same God who's with them now. So bless them and encourage them. And Father, thank you for this opportunity that we can come and sing and now hear your word preached to us. We pray that would you, by your Holy Spirit, prepare us. We pray for Pastor Paul as he preaches that would you give him clarity. That through the preaching of your word that you deepen our love for you. And that through that, you convict us, encourage us, and challenge us to love you and to follow you for all the days of our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to be with you guys this morning. Hope you're encouraged so far through the prayers and the singing of God's word. And uh, yeah, just want to say once again, John, Sana, we're super excited you guys are here today. Thank you for leading so far already. And uh, yeah, I think you know, we're all excited. So thanks again. Um, turning your Bibles, Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21 today. Have you ever heard of the curriculum called Christianity Explored? Anybody in this room? A few people? Yeah. So it's similar to Alpha, if you know what Alpha is. Uh, I've led through Christianity Explored uh, both when I was, used to be at Northview and then also when we lived in Florida a couple of times. Uh, Christianity Explored, yeah, similar to Alpha. So you bring people who don't know Jesus to a... Um, to a, like a, a meeting where you have some dessert or maybe dinner and then you watch a video together and you have discussion around it. 
Um, and on, in that um, curriculum, Christianity Explored, the host himself, his name's Rico, Rico Tice, he's from England. And one of the videos, Rico talks about a time when he was at a, a party or a lunch. And they were just waiting in a line uh, as a part of this lunch. And uh, it, like, I think he was waiting to use the restroom or something like this. And he's waiting there, and there's another gentleman kind of beside him who he kind of recognizes, but doesn't fully recognize. And he can't really pinpoint it, so he just kind of nods, like, pleasant, hello, like, that's about it. No, um, no further conversation. He just kind of keeps to himself. And then a little while later at the lunch, he realizes when somebody else talks to this gentleman who he is, none other than Prince William. Oh, yeah, the young ladies, so excited. <laughs> Prince William, yeah, so imagine being, you know, you're an, an English, you're an English uh, citizen, and you, you were, had this opportunity to speak to your future king, and yet you let it pass because, oh, just couldn't, just couldn't recognize him. If only, and then as you watch the video, he says, if only I had recognized him, I would have said so much more. I would have been so much more polite and outgoing. And, but he didn't recognize him. And in order for us to properly respond to somebody, we have to recognize them for who they are, right? If you're going to know how to speak with somebody that you're coming into contact with, uh, then you know, if you know details about that person, you can know more fully of how to respond and how to interact with the person that you're talking to. And that is that way with anyone. And it's the same thing with Jesus. In order for us to respond rightly to Jesus, we have to recognize the fullness of who he is. If you believe that Jesus is only a teacher or only a prophet you won't respond properly. If you believe that he's divine but not human, you won't respond properly. So the big idea today as we go through this text is to follow Jesus. You have to recognize who he is. There's two points. Number one, follow, don't frustrate. Number two, recognize, don't reject. So as we get into the first point, we'll get into verse 21 of Matthew 16, which says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So the first three words, from that time, get you to ask the question, from what time? Well, from the previous few verses where Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ. And then Jesus told him that he was going to use him, Peter. I'm going to use you to build my church, he says. So going back to those verses, Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is, that's quite the rah-rah speech, right? Like, I'm going to build my church through you, Peter, and the rest of the disciples. I'm going to build the church through you, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Like, yes, Jesus, let's go! Right? Wouldn't that make you excited? And then Jesus' response to that is, I've got to go to Jerusalem and die. Okay, that's a kind of a mood killer there, Jesus. We don't really want to think about something like that, right? If you're one of the disciples, do you want to hear that? So Peter jumps in. Verse 22, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
Okay, so something that was a really big no-no back then in the discipleship relationship was that the disciple take the mentor aside or, and rebuke him publicly. Like, you don't rebuke your mentor at all, especially publicly. But that's what Peter does here. So what Peter does here is very outrageous. And not only is he going against their well-known customs, but he's rebuking the one who he just claimed to know was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then comes Jesus' response. He says, get behind me, Satan. And that word hindrance, a literal translation, is a stone of stumbling. So you think, what did he just name Simon? Peter, the rock, right? And on this rock, I'll build my church. Well, now Peter proves himself to be a different kind of rock, right? Stone of stumbling. So in other words, Peter, you're supposed to be the rock, but not that kind of rock. Now, calling him Satan to our ears or when we read this, it might seem like a harsh response, right? I mean, for Jesus to turn and call me Satan, I mean, that, that's about the worst thing that could ever happen to me, right? But if we look at what Peter did here, uh, Peter essentially was tempting Jesus the same way the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness. What did Satan offer Jesus in the wilderness? He said, bow to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Give you all the kingdoms. You can have all the kingdoms without the cross, Jesus. Was what Satan was offering him. And now Peter basically does the same thing. He's like, far be it from you. You don't have to die, Jesus. So Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. See, in Peter's mind, the Messiah, the great Messiah, will vanquish all of Israel's enemies. But in Jesus' mind, he knew his mission was far greater and far bigger than what Peter had in mind. So in verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So if someone wants to know what the cost of following Jesus is, there's no better verse to turn to than this. This is where the martyred missionary Jim Elliot got his famous quote from when he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So self-denial, self-sacrifice, personal loss for kingdom gain. This is what it means to follow Jesus. Now, I think this passage is also, are often applied in a way where people look at it financially. I think having the word, what does it profit a man? Right? People automatically think, oh, like it's talking about financial gain. That this is what it's about. Well, and that might be what it is for some people. But for others, it's other things. Because think about the context here. Is, is Peter looking for financial gain in this moment? That's not what's happening here. Peter's not looking for a financial gain. He was looking for the Messiah to bring Israel's kingdom back in worldly power and glory. He had this idea of what God's kingdom needed to be. And for Jesus to die, that wasn't going to work out. So Peter needed a change of vision. It's a question for us today. How's our vision? What's your vision? Do you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? Or is it more like, my kingdom come and my will be done? Think about your plans for your life. Your plans for your life. Are you willing to let God interrupt those plans? 
Are you willing to let God interrupt those plans with something like a call to ministry? Or maybe he'll interrupt your plans with the need to help your family because of some crisis or some situation. And all of a sudden, all your plans have to go aside. Are you willing to do that? Or, or will you be angry at God for it? Or maybe it's your dream job, whatever that would be. And you know that to get there, you're going to need to make compromises on God's word. I mean, does God, you know, you go to God's word and, and, and you go, well, oh, did he really say that? Like, do I have to worry about that? Do I have to think about this? Or are you really going to fully commit to God's holy and inerrant word in your life? Or maybe for you, it is financial some comfort and security that you have to give up. You've looked at your savings account and it's grown large and you're happy, but you're looking at inflation and you're like, well, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And you really never get enough. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Luke 12 where a rich man he has this massive crop and he grows this massive crop and he has a barn, but it's like overflowing out of his barn. He's like, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to tear this barn down and build another one. So that's bigger so that I can put it in there and then I'll be comfortable for years and years and years to come. I'm not going to have to worry. Instead of sharing his crop, instead of blessing others with his crop, what does he do? He puts it in this bigger barn. And what does God say to him that night? He comes to him and he says, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Friends, taking up your cross and following Jesus means that empowered by the Holy Spirit, you are submitting, surrendering your whole life. Not just the few sins that you can think about right now. Not just the things that you've done in the past that you're ashamed of and you're going to leave your shame there. No, not just that. Everything. You're going to submit your whole life to Jesus. You're going to literally pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Your kingdom, Jesus, and however that needs to happen in my life and in the lives of people around me and in my church and in my community. Your kingdom, Jesus. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Jesus. It means submitting our whole life to him and his will. Up to and including giving up your own life. And when he returns, he will judge us all. Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So don't let your, your goals, your visions, your plans... Don't let those things lead you to disobedience. Don't let those things become your little kingdom that you need to have aside from God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. Follow God's word. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. On to the second point, recognize, don't reject Continuing into chapter 17 and seeing something extraordinary here. 17 verse 1, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. So six days after Jesus rebuked Peter and the disciples 
or, and told the disciples that some of them would see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before they tasted death. He takes three of them, so he takes some of them up a high mountain where he is then transfigured before their very eyes. So this is probably what Jesus meant when he said that in the previous verse. In the previous verse when he said, when he said that some would not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then, and then Matthew includes, so six days later, this happens. This is probably what Jesus was referring to. And it would have been an astonishing sight. I mean, imagine that. You're going up this tall mountain with Jesus, and you get up there, and all of a sudden, I mean, he's, his face is shining bright, and his clothes are white, and Moses and Elijah are there, and I mean, it's stunning. Like, that's like Isaiah chapter 6, where he's, he's in the throne room of God, and he sees, he sees God in his glory and splendor in his own throne room. That's like Moses on Sinai. Like that's the level of astonishment that this would be. And these three disciples get to experience it. Continuing verse 4. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So consider all that's happening here. You've got... Moses there representing the law. You've got Elijah there representing the prophets. You've got Jesus' face shining like the sun and a cloud descending upon them and a voice from God speaking. Does that sound like anything that you've heard in the Old Testament? Yeah, Moses on Sinai. And that's how we should see this because that's how the original readers of Matthew would have seen it. They would have heard all, the, all of this language and they would have been like, whoa, like this is a new thing that God is doing here in Jesus. And it's, this is like, like in the Old Testament when we heard about Moses doing this, Moses received the written word, now we're receiving the living word. God's own son. And how does Peter react? Hey Jesus, tell you what, I'll go down to Canadian Tire, get a few tents, set them up for you and the boys. You can camp out here for a bit. It should be good. It should be good. It's good that I'm here, man. I can run down and do that for you. I mean, Peter. Peter, once again, not recognizing what's happening here, um, and he speaks out of turn. So look at God's response. It's gracious, but terrifying. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, stop bringing your ideas of what you think needs to happen here. Zip it. Mouth shut, ears open. Peter. Listen to Jesus. So the question for us, is that any different in our day? Is that any different in our day? Because honestly, Christians nowadays do this. Or people who claim to be Christians. The culture around us even does this. They build little tents out of their 21st century North American ideals and they say, hey Jesus, it's good I'm here for you. Now sit in this little tent I made for you. That's where I want to keep you, Jesus, in this nice little tent. Not in those things. No, no, I, your, no not your kingdom. No, tent, here, sit. How I form and uh, the things that I want you to be for, Jesus, I'm going to put you in that. And then with any unpopular opinion that God's word mentions, they explain it away and they say, Jesus fits quite nicely into the little tent I made for him. 
And they end up with a Jesus that's not Lord, but one that looks a lot more like the plush Jesus that Hallmark sells. He's quite cuddly. Is that the kind of Jesus you want? A Jesus is just nice and cuddly and makes you feel warm at night. Because for real, are we ready to listen to Jesus? Are we ready to listen to Jesus and his word in every area of our lives? Or do you want to keep your ideas for his kingdom or your cultural lenses on when you look at him? And when you do that, thereby reducing his lordship. Because when we read that, when we read the scriptures and we see things that don't, that aren't popular in the culture around us, what are we going to do with that? So when we read that God created man in his own image and breathed life into his nostrils, are we going to believe that? Like literally, God made man in his own image out of the dust, forming him, breathing life into his nostrils as a special pinnacle of creation? Or are we going to try to do something to make it all fit within the theory of evolution? Or when we read that God created humanity as two distinct genders, the man first and then the woman, are we going to accept it or are we going to try to find some other explanation Or when we read that God created sex to be enjoyed only between one man and one woman in heterosexual marriage, do we follow that and believe it? And are we going to live by it? Or are we going to kind of try to justify some other things? Are you ready to listen when Jesus says that hating your brother is equivalent to murder? Are you ready to listen when Jesus says that lusting after women is the same as committing adultery? When we read that Jesus is the one way of salvation, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him, are we going to believe that and live by it? Or is that too exclusive for you? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Jesus is the living word. And when we listen to scripture, we listen to Jesus. We need to recognize his voice and listen, not reject him. Not minimize what he says, not try to kind of fudge around the margins to try to make his words fit within our little tent. I realize I touched on some hot button issues today. And if you have questions about these things, if you're here, you're a skeptic, or some of these things are things you struggle with, first I want to say, I'm honestly, me and the pastors and the rest of the church, we're glad you're here. We want you to be here to listen, to hear about Jesus, to meet Jesus, to know the, the community of God's people, to feel love and warmth and acceptance and all these things. But second, I want you to know that myself or one of the other pastors or leaders in the church, we're happy to sit with you and chat with you, hear your story. You want to hear about what's going on. There's something in your family, maybe. Maybe there's a history. Maybe there's past church issues that you've had that have made it really tough. I understand that. And we're more than happy to sit with you and hear about those things and pray with you. But we do want you to recognize and know and follow the real Jesus. Continuing verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. 
See, Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, all these great heroes of the faith that came prior to Jesus, but they all point to the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. The one who suffered and died and rose again, just as he said he would. So Jesus, your king, is standing with you right now. Do you recognize him? And if you do, respond to him rightly. Let's pray. Father, it is a gift to worship as your people. Lord, to sing praises to you and lift our voices and our hands in, in praise of your name and your glory and to honestly, Lord, be refreshed in worship services before we get sent out into the rest of our week. So, Lord, I praise you for this time together. And, Lord, I praise you for your word and how good it is to be able to go and to see examples, Lord, that, that, that in your word you didn't just give us um, just platitudes to live by, but, Lord, in your word you gave us examples of your people who went before us who were called by you, specifically called by you to be a big part of the birth of the church in Peter and the disciples. Yet, Lord, even in Peter, we see his failings. And Lord, that should give us comfort and grace because we can see how you worked through him mightily, even with his failures and even with his faults. And Lord, we know that you can do the same thing with us by your spirit. So Lord, as we are fed all sorts of messages, um, from our culture around us, from the different media we take in and the different things we look at on the internet and the different conversations we have, Lord, would you, by your spirit, make Jesus stand out as Lord of our lives? Lord, would all of us lay down all of our little kingdoms at your cross, whether that's our dreams, our desires, our, our, our visions, our finances, our families, Lord, may we all lay them down at the foot of your cross and truly take up our cross and follow you. So Lord, bless us here as we continue to sing. May you be glorified. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hope my shepherd
has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus blood and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hope my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my king oh the chains are released I can sing And day by day, I know He will renew me until I stand with joy. songs of loudest praise. Sing. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, bound to thy
to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. At thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Sing. Prone to wander, Lord, I flee. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal. Seal it for thy courts of Now we're gonna um, we're gonna come back in here in a few minutes and have a Q and A time with John and Sana. Um, so, but give you guys a few minutes to go get your kids from children's ministry, grab a coffee, uh, visit for a few minutes, and we'll come back in here. Say ten minutes uh, at ten to twelve. We'll come back in here, okay? So uh, let me send you though. Some of you aren't staying, so let me send you the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.